Welcome, everyone. I am Bob Wurzelbach, the director of the Respect Life Office for the Archdiocese of Cincinnati, and this is our video podcast series that we call Being Pro-Life. Each month, we'll discuss a different topic in the Respect Life arena. We'll hear a personal story from someone deeply affected by that issue. And finally, we'll share ways that you can get involved. Today's topic is grieving the loss of an unborn child, including miscarriage, stillbirth, ectopic pregnancy, and today we have several guests. Will you please introduce yourselves? Hello, my name is Renee Cortez Ernst. I'm from Buffalo, New York originally, but I've been living here in Cincinnati, Ohio, and I am the mother of three children. My name is Jennifer Shack. I'm the Director of Media Relations for the Archdiocese of Cincinnati. My name is Stephen Durini, and I'm the father of Adelina, Declan, Francis, and Lincoln, and a licensed professional clinical counselor in Ohio. Mary Durini, I'm a stay-at-home mom with our two kids, Adelina and Declan, that are four and three. Renee, can you share your story with us? Sure. My husband and I had our son, Aiden, and we just absolutely fell in love with him. He was the light of our lives, and we knew that we wanted to have more of him because he was so amazing. So we started trying to have more kids, and it took us quite a while. So after three and a half years, we finally got pregnant. Super excited. So we were planning on telling our family around my mother's birthday because then it would be around that like 13 week mark where everything was supposed to be good and everything. Then I was having some weird bleeding and I'm like, this is not normal. This didn't happen in my other pregnancy. You know, this is kind of unsettling. You know, they said everything was fine. Next day, even more, more bleeding. So I really started worrying. I was having pains. I was having crampings. So I called the doctor, went into the office, and they do an ultrasound. And they're looking around, and they're saying, well, I don't see a heartbeat. So we're going to get the doctor in here. So the doctor comes in, and he tells us that we were having what was called an ectopic pregnancy, which means that the baby was implanted in the fallopian tubes instead of in the uterus where the baby should have been. So I was thinking, okay, just move the baby, you know, like, but that's not what you can do. So they said, I'm sorry, but we're going to have to schedule a surgery. And that's what we're going to have to do. So of course, that was devastating to me and my husband, you know, like, we waited so long to have this baby. We couldn't tell anybody about what was going on. It was really, really hard because this was what we had hoped to do. We were a week away from like letting everybody know, having a picture of the baby, of the heartbeat, the whole nine yards. And then our world just got turned around. And instead of a picture, we were going in for surgery and it just came crashing down on us. Every hope that we had, every dream we had of bringing this new baby was now not going to happen. Just for the public to understand, who may not be all that familiar with, with ectopic pregnancy, I'll share really quickly when the baby is in the fallopian tube instead of being the uterus. Medical science is not now able to move that baby out of the tube. If you leave it alone, what will inevitably happen is that baby will grow too big for the fallopian tube and the tube will rupture, which threatens the life of the mother. No matter what you do, the baby cannot survive. So you have a surgery to remove the, that fallopian tube. That is something that saves the life of the mother. It is not something that is intended to kill the child, but that is an inevitable consequence of that surgery. And that is considered a perfectly acceptable and moral option to do, as, as sad and as heartbreaking as it is. Okay, Jennifer, can you share your story with us? Yeah, absolutely, Bob. I uh, wanted to talk to you about a miscarriage that I experienced in my, my first miscarriage. I've had, I have three children, my husband and I, and I was pregnant with our fourth child. And we found out we were pregnant in December, a couple of weeks before Christmas, and waited through the holiday season to tell our family and told them at the beginning of January. And everybody's very excited. Told the kids that I was pregnant and hadn't gone to the doctor yet, but had not had any complications with the first three pregnancies. So at 10 weeks pregnant, I went to my first doctor appointment and at the ultrasound, the technician very quickly could tell that there was no heartbeat for the baby. So having 
gone through it three times before and always been a heartbeat and always at healthy pregnancies. You don't see that coming like at all. Were they able to tell you at that time, like they know the heartbeat stopped at, at this level of development or recently or weeks ago? Right. So I was 10 weeks pregnant. And the first thing was them saying there was no heartbeat. And from there, they did a measurement of the fetus to say that it was only measuring eight weeks in size. So that was kind of a secondary confirmation that the baby had passed in the last couple of weeks. So at that point, they encouraged me to think about what I'd like to do and gave me some options of a surgery to take care of removing the fetus and taking care of the remains as well. Obviously, I'm Catholic, and so that option would have included cremating and burying remains if I wanted to have surgery. The other option was to take a medication to force a miscarriage at home or to wait until I naturally had the miscarriage. And they said that could be anywhere from one to two weeks. So my husband and I discussed it, and when we decided to wait until I naturally had the miscarriage, that also gave us time to think about, well, what will I do when I have the miscarriage? And thankfully, I had last fall heard about Heaven's Gain Ministry, which is a ministry here in the Archdiocese of Cincinnati, but they mail out and serve across the country via their website that offers products and services for women who have had a pregnancy loss. So I visited that ministry and talked to them about what to expect with the miscarriage and how to handle our baby's remains and how to do it in a respectful manner that we wanted to do. So we were able to buy some products from them and prepare to handle that. We also talked to our pastor who happens to be a friend of ours. So that was a nice conversation to have. And there is a cemetery on the grounds for our church. So he immediately insisted that if we wanted to, we could bury the baby at the cemetery at our parish. Right. Since you mentioned Heaven's Gain, that happens to be a ministry that's also directly on our website. I'll show it to everyone. It's so heavensgain.org, Heaven's Gain Ministries. They offer pregnancy loss products and services. Scroll down here a little bit. They have first trimester, second trimester, and third trimester, baby and infant caskets, infant urns, memorial gifts, books. They also have phone advocacy. They have counseling services as well. She was extremely friendly and informative and kind and supportive and offered prayers and expertise. So that part was appreciated as well. Right. So, so Mary and Stephen, tell us what you're here to tell us about. Uh, well, our story, so we had our first two children really close together. They're 13 months apart, and they are just the joy of our lives. They bring us so much happiness. So we were getting ready for baby number three. We, I went into the labor, so everything was going fine and normal. And then when our son was born, his name is Lincoln Eugene, mm -hmm. and the doctors were very concerned. There were several physical abnormalities that seemed to point to some kind of genetic thing that, that caused a problem in brain development. And so they rushed our son Lincoln to the NICU. Then they were running diagnostic tests on him and they kept coming back with worse news about our son Lincoln and his condition. Mm -hmm. So we decided to have him sent to the children's hospital here. And then as soon as I was able to be discharged, we went over to the children's hospital. But by the time we got there, it was pretty clear that our son was only going to live for a short time. and His brain had hardly developed. So it was pretty clear that we kind of went from trying to save our son to knowing that we needed to say goodbye to him. And so we had his siblings come and meet him. And that was a very special time that they, my, mm -hmm. so our son Lincoln is, he doesn't look like a normal child and our, our little children Adelina and Declan just came in and loved him and mm -hmm. were saying, that's my brother and trying to give him high fives and hugs. Mm -hmm. It was just really beautiful. And then they made an exception for the NICU and we were able to have our whole family come for a baptism, which is about probably 40 people that's with all the siblings and cousins. Uh, so we were able to have them all come in for a baptism. And so we were able to spend three days with our son. And then he was born on a Wednesday and then on Saturday, he passed and mm -hmm. it was very hard yeah. and then so we found out shortly after our son was born and died that I was a genetic carrier for something that could cause the same problem with the future child but we still had two healthy kids and so we were thinking that it would probably happen eventually again 
Mm-hmm. but we weren't thinking that it would happen right away. Mm-hmm. So we were able to get pregnant fairly soon after. Very excited, I think very hopeful that this would be redeeming, that this would be the blessing kid after you know, we went through this hard time. So we did have the ultrasound for this time around. And at that ultrasound, we found out that another son had the same condition and that he too would soon pass away after birth. And our doctor was going to send us to try to be counseled for an abortion. Mm -hmm. And we both told him no. Mm -hmm. And I don't know if he had a change of heart about his options, but I know that he was blessed by us. And he just did a lot of things throughout the pregnancy that supported us. It was really special, those four months that we had with him to be able to cherish him. And I think having him in my womb and feeling all of his kicks and just being so thankful for the time that we had with him and the time that our son and daughter were able to just have him be a part of our life for those months. And knowing that it was going to end soon just made everything more special. It was so hard. You're, you're walking with the joy of carrying life, but then also the sorrow with knowing that he's going to pass away very shortly. So he ended up being born a little after 39 weeks, and we had named him after St. Francis of Assisi, Mm -hmm. and I went into labor, and then when he was born, he kind of just took one breath, and he passed away very shortly after he was born, but he was able to be baptized by Mm -hmm. the same priest that had baptized our son Lincoln. And then after that, he was able to meet his siblings. He was able to meet his grandparents. And we had godparents that were able to come to the hospital to meet him. And we had him with us for a little while and were able to love him. And That's something that we are so grateful for is just that we did get to spend that time with them, even though it was so short. And I don't think Barry and I would change anything about that choice. And I know people who kind of make the argument for abortion, they're coming from a place where they're trying to prevent pain, but actually it was such a grace and such a salve to our souls, just actually meeting our sons and getting to hold them. And also just knowing now that our children are in heaven and that that's something Mary and I both have to look forward to is meeting Lincoln and Francis when when we go to heaven. So, so Mary and Stephen, your story particularly right now, it's such a powerful witness for anyone else who's been in some kind of prenatal diagnosis, but mm-hmm. for any, anyone who may down the road or is in the midst of that kind of a dramatic, you know, decision like, wow, I know that my child has this issue and I know that either it's going to be a life of suffering or life will be very short and, I, and I'm feeling mm-hmm. a lot of pressure to aboard what can we say to a couple like that facing these kinds of issues i would say two things i would say one i think we should always approach life with the virtue of humility because the reality is we have predictions and we have science and we have these tests that tell us with a good chance what is going to happen but even with lincoln wasn't expected that he was going to live three days and the second thing would be the virtue of hope that even amidst suffering and that pain, which there's no way of avoiding that pain, whether you get an abortion or whether you make the choice that we did. The pain of losing your child is there and there's no way to duck around that or to avoid it. But you can experience that pain in the virtue of hope, hoping in God, hoping that the time that you have with your child will be beautiful. It's tempting to give in to despair. It's tempting to to just try to avoid and duck around it. But those would be the two things, humility and hope. First of all, thank you everyone for sharing your stories. The reason why this is one of our topics for the Being Pro-Life series here is that unfortunately, a lot of people do not recognize topic pregnancy, miscarriage, uh, perhaps even stillbirth or, or birth of a nearly four, full-term child who died or died shortly after birth, even though don't recognize that as a loss in the same way that they recognize the loss of a child who has been born for some time, particularly perhaps in miscarriage or related a type of pregnancy losses. There might not even be any kind of a church service or recognition of this grief. So do you have recommendations for parishes or pastors or bereavement teams on what they can do to better prepare for when they find out of a family or a mother who's had a miscarriage to take care of them? 
because we're very personal people. I was raised, you know, like, why bother people with your problems if you can handle it yourself? But there's so much stuff you can't handle on your own. And sometimes you don't actually realize that until it comes full force at you. And when somebody takes your hand and says, you don't have to be alone, I'll help you is when you really realize, wow, you feel weight lifted off your shoulders because yeah, hey, I'm not alone. So having a church and a community saying, here's my hand, take it, you're not alone. That's a great thing to have. Uh, yeah, our pastor was extremely supportive of immediately offering for the option to bury the baby at the cemetery. Not only that option, but taking care of uh, digging up the grave and the actual headstones. And then headstones of miscarried children will all be in the same section and all have a, a, a uniform look to them. So it has the last name, it has the year. And so we had family come down after 11 a.m. mass and, and all gathered a few weeks ago. I think that for women who have a short window to find out they're about to have one or they had no heads up and they're just having one, the hardest thing is you're going through, I'm losing my baby right now, but you're not taking that next mental step, I think, a lot to say, now what do I do with my baby remains? Because you don't hear about services frequently. You don't hear about ministries often that assist you with that. So what I would advocate that there's a place to bury or to respectfully cremate and bury remains. And some decisions women make may be more difficult and regrettable. I think, and, and this would depend on the person, but maybe throwing like a small baby shower or something like that, just to celebrate the pregnancy and the life that the mother is carrying. That would strike me as a really great way to do that. For the, in our parish, we had a meal train, like several people from the moment, a few weeks after we found out about Francis, his diagnosis, till a couple months after his birth and death, we had people providing meals to us from our parish and mm. from our different friends. And that was very helpful. I, I think grief is very tiring and it is a lot of work to kind of go through grief. So any physical support is really very helpful too. Mm -hmm. So what about even the average person in the pew? Sometimes people can be outright rude, but other times people can be trying to be helpful, but say things that really aren't helpful. And what they're saying is not recognizing the loss. So do you have some advice to people on what not to say or what to say if they hear about a friend who has experienced a miscarriage or a topic pregnancy? Remember to love first and to be kind first. And that a loss of a, a loved one, especially a child, is a tragic loss. I had twins after my ectopic pregnancy. So they say after you have a loss and then you have a baby, they're your rainbow babies. So I had a double rainbow. So I've had people say, God, you're not gonna have any more, are you? Like, that'd be horrible. Well, no, like having more kids would never be horrible, especially since I've lost some, you know, like I think that hurts a little bit or gosh, you have so many. Like three kids I don't think is so many. You know, I, you hear people say, well, why did you tell people already that you were pregnant at nine weeks or, or whatnot in case you might lose the baby? Which is a silly thought yes. because if you lose the baby Don't. at nine weeks, you need your friends and family to support you. You still want to acknowledge that was your fourth child. I think that you know any sort of like trying to comfort somebody and saying like, well, you only knew you were pregnant for two weeks. Like any sort of like trying to quantify how much you maybe loved your child based on an amount of time that you knew they were pregnant is just not helpful. Not a good idea. <laughs> right. <laughs> you know, I recommend to offer prayers. If you can't think of anything else to say, if you're not sure, offer some prayers. Those will be greatly appreciated. I think so often there's a hesitancy to bring it up because you're like, I don't want to put that on that person's mind if they weren't already thinking about it. And I guess what I could say is that the person probably is already thinking about it. We've been very blessed by the people who have just asked, you know, how are you doing? I was thinking of Francis today, or I was thinking of Lincoln today, or are there any small ways that we can help? So being proactive would be the first one. I think asking about it and just listening these types of difficult emotions like sadness and grief are very hard for us to sit with. And I think that's why we often say things where it's like you want to catch your tongue because it's like, I really hope I didn't offend that person. But 
We say the things because we're not comfortable just sitting with that person and encountering the grief. I think everyone just wants to make it better and they just want to fix it. But the reality is it it can't be fixed. And we've been really blessed by the people, yeah, that just come and sit in our grief with us and Mm -hmm. just be sad with us and don't try to fix it, but just Mm -hmm. be sad with us. So another suggestion to be in it for the long haul. So when these events occurred with Lincoln and Francis, usually the first couple weeks, there's a lot of people coming in. There's a lot of support, a lot of people. But the reality is compassion fatigue is real and people sort of forget as time goes on. A suggestion would be to really have a mind for how can I support for the long haul, maybe three or four months down the road, checking in, you know, remembering anniversaries is very helpful. So marking it in your calendar and kind of that's that's a great time to, to bring it up, to ask the person or to shoot them a text. Again, that's a very hard day for the parents or for whoever has lost a loved one. And so just remembering that is very helpful. So are there things that or, or phrases that you think people commonly say that they should be so don't say this. I think it is hard when people, you know, say like time heals all wounds or oh he's in a better place or try expressions. Those are hard or the other one is the well, at least you have two healthy kids and that's also hard to hear because it's it's an attempt to minimize the loss, but there is no way to minimize that loss. I want to make everybody aware of an event coming up on April 29th. So I'm going to share the screen here. If you want, if you want to go to the website at www.catholiccincinnati.org slash unborn loss, there's an event coming up April 29th at four different locations in our archdiocese it's called In the Presence of God. It's a healing mass for anyone who's lost an unborn child miscarriage, stillbirth, abortion, early infant loss. They'll be in foreign locations. So there's two in Cincinnati, one at St. Ignatius Loyola Parish in Montfort Heights in Cincinnati, and the other one at St. Veronica in Cincinnati. And then St. Albert the Great Kettering, which is Dayton area, and Maria Stein Spiritual Center up north. So any of those locations at 7 p.m. on Monday, April 29th. Uh, you don't have to register, but uh, we will be offering candles for anyone in order to remember the child you're entrusting to God. So if you uh, want to have a candle reserved for you, you do need to register for that. But I encourage anyone either who has experienced a loss like this at any time, recently or decades ago, or anyone who just wants to come and support those who have had this kind of loss. Just go ahead and come to this event. We hope this would be the beginning or continuing of the recognition of life and and continue of the grief process and the opportunity to meet others who might have similar stories to yours. We'll hope to point people towards support groups if you're looking for a support group of sharing and talking with people who have had similar experience too. We hope that will also be helpful. Okay. Is there anything else that you feel like just about the topic in general you, you want to make sure is, is shared that we entered into this interview? So my husband and I had a conversation about what an important step it was for our children to see the pro-life message. They had a sibling. Um, our fourth child was the, is their sibling and is, you know, at the cemetery, but you know, has a resting place. And it was a very pro-life message for our children that we, they had a lot of questions Um, Our our kids are seven and almost five and two, and they were very interested. They wanted to know all about what was going to happen and what will happen and all those curious questions for kids, but they also seemed to be extremely respectful, and we just thought it was a good message for them as well. So, Well, thank all of you for sharing your stories with us today. We hope that today's topic will enlighten People to help us know that that pregnancy loss is a loss. It is a grief, whether it's miscarriage, ectopic pregnancy, uh, different, you know, stillbirth. These are losses and that we need to be just as present in our communities and our families uh, and our parishes as we do with any other kind of a loss. And we hope that we can uh, help people take the steps to put in place things in their parishes that they can do to be prepared to minister to women and families who lose children prior to birth or right after birth. So thank you all for sharing your stories. Okay, thank you, Bob, for having me. Thanks so much for having me on, Bob. Thank you so much for having us, Bob. It's been a real honor 
sharing our story and the story of Lincoln and Francis. Yeah, thank you for having us.